Last week was a sobering reminder, wasn't it? A sobering reminder that those who turn their backs on Christ after all they've been shown, that they necessarily suffer a worse punishment, right? It was another warning against apostasy. We said then, didn't we, that the gospel comes with a warning label. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And that's everyone, as we know. Adam represented the whole human race when he sinned. And so we all fell with him in his first sin. We are all born with our backs to God. But to those who have been turned about face, those who have been told what God is like, that he will punish sin, and that he reconciles sinners to himself through the sacrifice of his son, those who have received that knowledge of the truth and then turn their back on it, it's a very scary thing, he says. The author says, don't do that. Stick around, stay in the light, walk in the light, fight the good fight of faith until the end. And this morning he's encouraging them in how to do that, okay? So this will be a little more positive this morning. If there's sort of a uh, dark cloud looming over you last week, right? This will be some sunshine breaking through. So let's read together Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 39, finishing out the chapter there. Now hear the words of the one true and living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls." Father in heaven, Lord God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. God, that when in this world of uncertainty, we're not sure we can be sure of anything. We know we can be sure of your word, and we thank you for that, that it is unchanging, that the grass withers, the flower fades, but your word, O God, abides forever. Lord, I pray that you would make it plain to your hearers this morning, that you would be pleased to use me to do it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's the main idea, and I pray you'll be encouraged by this and maybe invigorated by this this morning, okay? Nothing can keep a professing believer out of heaven except a failure to persevere. The only way to lose is to quit. What the author gives them here is a cure for the apostasy he's warned them about. The, the safeguard against quitting. That's actually, there's, there's actually two of them here. Looking back to when your faith was fresh and looking forward to when faith turns to sight. That's how you persevere. You see that in the passage, don't you? I mean, I don't want you to think I'm making this up. He says there, doesn't he? Recall the former days. And then later on in verses 35 and 36, he talks about confidence and a great reward and receiving what is promised. Look back. And look forward. There's medicine for your doubts, for your fears. As you face trials and temptations to just give up. Want to know how to be sure you don't end up like the person we read about last week? There you go. Want to know how to stay on track and persevere to the end? There you go. So those would be your two points this morning, and they're like guardrails on the highway of faith faith that keep you from going off uh, into the ditches of apostasy. Looking back to when your faith was fresh, and looking forward to when faith turns to sight. Looking back, looking forward, remembering what came before, and dreaming of what lies ahead. So let's start there with looking back to when your faith was fresh. Recall the former days. 
What happened? When your faith was fresh. That's what he's asking them. That's what I'm asking you this morning. What was that like when your faith was fresh? Do you remember that? Those were good days when you were first enlightened, but there were probably hard days too. Those of you who came to Christ later in life, did you lose some friends? Did you miss out on some opportunities? I know I did. When the light of the gospel flashed on you and your heart burst into flames and your mind was filled with the knowledge of God, didn't the world grow a little colder, seemingly? Didn't you begin to feel at least a little bit like a stranger in it? I love the movie Inception, if, if any of y'all have seen that, and it's way too complicated to try to explain the whole thing, but basically you can get into dreams, okay? You can get into a person's dreams, and if you get in there and you start making a ruckus and causing a disturbance, the person's subconscious will recognize you as, as, as foreign, and all their eyes will be turned on you. They'll attack you, go after you. You know, it's like you're one of the characters in this person's dream, but if you're not acting the part, if you're not acting natural and blending in, everyone's eyes turn and look at you. You are not welcome there. Faithful Christians will experience that in the world, and these people had. These people had. But weren't you almost impervious to pain then, the author seems to say, right? And weren't you? Wasn't there a toughness about your resolve in the beginning when your faith was fresh? Wasn't there a, a toughness, a, a zeal, a passion, an excitement? And how'd that happen? Because this Christ is real, and he was working in your life. And if you reflect back on those times, if you recall the former days, you will see it. If you're unsure of how that's happening now, recall the former days. Be assured of his presence with you. You knew his grace was sufficient for you at one time. You demonstrated that when you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, he says, verse 32. Sometimes, he says, being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So that's a little what they were going through. They could look back on the times they'd been bullied and even punished for their proclamation that Jesus is Lord. And they'd even align themselves with people who, who, who got in trouble for that who were treated that way. They were throwing in their lot with people the culture was canceling. You had compassion on those in prison, he says, verse 34. And not from a distance, not from a distance. Early Christians visited people in prison a lot because Christians got locked up a lot. There were a lot of Christians in prison. In prison back then, it was like you got, you got locked up and forgotten about most of the time, you know? I mean, well, you didn't get three hots in a cot like you do now. If you didn't have someone on the outside visiting you, there's a good chance you weren't going to make it. But these Christians had compassion on their brothers and sisters, and didn't Jesus himself say, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, right? That's what they were doing. They did that. The author says, remember that? Remember when you did that? Remember the former days? Your suffering, your loving one another, your selflessness and generosity are all proofs that Christ was working in your lives. When's the last time you can remember Christ was really working in your life? That's a particularly important question for those of you who might be feeling like you're in a little bit of a spiritual drought right now in this season of life, however long this season may be. Or uh, for those of you who, truth be told, are, are backsliding as of late. You know, backsliding can really diminish any assurance that a believer has. You can flounder in that for a while and, and, and not feel so sure that God is with you. So when's the last time you felt sure? That's the question. Think back. It's not a homework assignment. You'll forget by the time you leave here. Do it now. Think back. When's the last time you felt sure? 
looking back on that time, whenever it was for you, I mean, don't you say, man, it was so real back then. It was so real, it was so evident. His work in me was apparent. It was so obvious. That's how you get back on the horse when you've been knocked down. That's how you stay on track. Look back. Recall the former days. You endured hard trials, the author says. You see what he's doing, y'all? He's, he's laying out their reasons and their excuses for thinking about leaving in the first place, right? This is why they're thinking about leaving in the first place. This is hard, you know, this is, uh, you know, our, our people are getting locked up. We're getting our stuff stolen. And he's using all of those things to demonstrate that they've endured it because of Christ and for Christ's sake. Those are good signs, he says. This, this is proof that Christ is at work in their lives. Their willingness to suffer is living by faith, which is what he keeps telling them they must do. To keep doing it. Look back to how you've done it before and remember how far you've already come. He's showing them something important there to encourage them. He's talked about those who have, who have left the church, uh, the apostates. And he says, that's not you. He's trying to encourage them with that. That's not you. They suffered and left. You suffered and you're still here. Stay here. Don't be like them. See, suffering weeds out phonies in the church. It weeds out fair weather fans. False professors leave where faith must be proven. False professors leave when things get hard. Suffering in the Christian life is part of God's design because it makes us more like Jesus, and false professors don't want to be more like Jesus. So part of what he's saying here is there's been a thinning of the herd You've all seen it. You've seen the ones that have left. You've seen the ones that have walked out. There's been a thinning of a herd, and you should consider the fact that you're still here. That's a good sign. So don't quit now, right? Don't quit now. That'd be dumb, wouldn't it? You heard the example I gave to the children. I mean, imagine, you know, climbing Mount Everest. I don't know why people do that, y'all, but people do, yeah. But imagine you're climbing Mount Everest, and you're almost to the top. You're like, meh, I don't know. Doesn't seem worth it. Ah, this is hard. I'm going to go back. And you turn around and head back down the mountain. Why would you do that? You're almost there. Why, why would you stop now? Now's not the time for quitting. Quitting would have been like day one, right? Before you went through all the, the frostbite and, you know, starving and going delirious because there's not enough oxygen. Like you should have quit back then, not now when you're almost there. Now, I want to jump ahead to the next point too quickly about, about reward when faith becomes sight. But brothers and sisters, I want, to, I want to help you realize something this morning, if you haven't already. We are nearer to heaven today than we ever have been. Every week that we meet like this, we're one week closer. You, you got that? Now, might we have a long way to go yet? God knows. But what we know is this, we've come this far. Don't turn back now. That's what the author's telling them. Remember the effect the gospel had on you. And don't throw away your confidence, he says in verse 35. And you know, thinking back on that zeal that you once had in the beginning, it really is a great rejuvenator. I think sometimes, sadly, we look back on that and we're, we're, we, we get embarrassed. I think we've got to balance that out a little bit. Think back on when your faith was fresh, when you were on fire for God. You know, sadly, what I notice and frankly angers me is, is that a lot of Christians and church leaders scold that kind of freshly minted Christian zeal. I know this is a general, generalization. There are exceptions. You know, there's a big problem in the church in our part of the world where rather than helping young Christians put a saddle on that wild stallion and ride that war horse into battle, we say, don't worry, son, you'll grow out of that one day. Well, oh boy, I can't wait. <laughs> we teach freshly born again believers it's better to take no action than imperfect action because we don't want them to embarrass themselves or us. 
And God forbid we trust the Holy Spirit to use their rambunctious zeal to win souls. We'd prefer they just tone it down a little bit and be as dull and as impotent as we are and quickly, as quickly as possible so that we can go back to playing church instead of being salt and light as we're called to be. That's a pity. It is manageable. It's, you know, it's less risky. But it's, it's also why there's probably 70 of you here this morning and not 700. Equip young and zealous Christians early on. Teach them how to aim and direct their passion and their zeal instead of just how to keep it under control and waiting for it to peter out. Do that and they will be evangelists for life. They won't hesitate to invite people to church. They won't hesitate to share the gospel and have gospel conversations with strangers. Now here's the deal, okay? That's not too late for you. That's not too late for any of you. You didn't miss the boat. Just look back to when your faith was fresh. Let that recharge you. Recover the joy you had at first over your salvation. See where Christ has been at work in your life and all the things that he's brought you through and then charge ahead with renewed vigor. That's what these people needed. That's what these people at this time, that's what they needed. That's why he's telling us. Isn't that what you need too this morning? Renewed vigor. I do. I don't want to complain, y'all. God doesn't like grumbling, as it turns out. So it wouldn't do me any good if I did. But you know, I've had a rough last part of the year in a lot of ways. I think a lot of us could use some fresh steam and a second wind. Amen? Then look how far you've already come and look forward to what lies ahead. Don't stop short of the goal line. And that's important to remember, y'all. That's going to be really important for you to remember. You're going to have to keep that top of mind because in case you haven't noticed, Christians who really live out their faith and are consistent in their commitment to the Word of God are not welcome in our, in our culture. We're like a bunion on the toe of society that they haven't figured out how to remove yet. We have to expect that. Or when it comes... You'll be like some of these people that have already left. You'll be the ones looking for exit signs when the suffering comes. You can just ask a Canadian pastor who was torn away from his wailing children out in front of his house and escorted off to prison for refusing to close his church during COVID. It would have been easier for him to comply. No suffering required. None whatsoever. No suffering required. It would have been easier for him to comply. Could have found an exit. Could have taken the exit. He knew the suffering was worth it. He knew the reward was worth it. That's point number two. Looking forward to when faith turns to sight. In verse 35 and 36, the author talks about reward. Right? Remember what's behind you, but remember too what's ahead of you. You will receive what is promised. This is why we need endurance. So that, he says, when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Verse 36. This is why I ask you, why, why do you think, and maybe this isn't you, that's fine. I think this is generally true for a lot of Christians. Why do you think we start to get uncomfortable when we talk about rewards? Why is that? You know, the reality is we're wired for reward. God didn't give Adam uh, work to do for work's sake. You know, he didn't say work because I say so. He let him have the joy and the blessing of seeing what the work of his hands produced. We, we're supposed to want to earn things. That's a pre-fall thing, okay? Not a consequence of the fall thing. It's not a result of sin, but we get uptight about expecting rewards as Christians because we know salvation isn't something that can be earned, right? We know salvation cannot be earned, we can't earn God's blessings. We know, uh, as we said when we looked at Proverbs a moments ago, 
that there's blessings for obedience, there's curses for disobedience, but we can't make God our debtor, right? We can't do something good over here that we know will be pleasing to God and then turn around and say with our hand open, okay, God, pay up. We don't do that. But it is nonetheless true that God talks about rewards for his people and lays them out as incentives for us. That's a thing. He's doing it right here in these verses. Don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward. What's that saying? Keep moving because you're moving towards something good. That's what that's saying. Don't ever forget it. You're going to need endurance to stay in the race, and there's a prize at the end of that race. It is a promise. That's working for a reward, and there's nothing wrong with that. In our men's Bible study, we talked a lot about uh, what a godly man is, and we said it's somebody who rejects passivity, who takes responsibility, who leads courageously, and expects the greater reward. It's so much more than anything the world has to offer, and better. And we should want it. That's what I'm saying. Wanting it keeps us on track. Looking forward to when faith turns to sight. Jesus himself went to the cross for the joy set before him. He rescued his bride, received the ends of the earth as, as his possession. His father promised him that. Looking forward to reward is not a sinful fleshly thing. Now, if it's an obsession with selfish gain, then of course it is, right? We're supposed to put that to death, but we're also supposed to be looking forward to heaven, aren't we? We're supposed to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Isn't that what Jesus said? You know, we're not, we're not told not to think about those things. We're told to think about those things. How often do we? How often do you think about heaven? How often do you think about that reward that lies ahead? That's a good exercise for someone who wants to stay on track. Someone who doesn't want to lose heart when things get hard. It's a good exercise for someone feeling a little worn out in their walk with Christ right now. We're supposed to be looking forward to the, that grand finale, the final resurrection and the wedding feast of the Lamb when all things are finally and fully renewed. God's faithful ones... We get to look forward to that, and we should be looking forward to that. Looking forward to that reward, that day, when not only do we enjoy the, the, the treasures there, but when our faith is turned to sight, when we live in perfect harmony with our Creator and Redeemer, no longer weighed down by indwelling sin, but renewed completely, body and soul. That hope and that expectation is what keeps us on track and preserves our souls. What he's going to do next in chapter 11 is he's going to give us loads of examples of people who have done just that. To say it's been done, that this can happen. He's, he's going to give a long list of names recorded in what we like to call the hall of faith, right, in Hebrews 11, of all the people that have beat us there, who have endured to the end, and now enjoy the reward that awaits us. Don't forget the great reward that awaits you. Knowing that finish line is out there is part of what keeps you moving. The other part is remembering again how far you've come already. Now, I don't know about you, but that's, that's exciting, isn't it? I mean, anybody that says the Christian life is boring just isn't paying attention, are they? I mean, come on. This is, it can be hard at times, sure, right? But this, this is exciting stuff. It really is an, an, an adventure, isn't it? There are no shortcuts to any place worth going. So we expect that there are some hardships, and we know God tells the best stories, and the best stories have heroes and villains and conflict. And that's the story we're living in. And the only way to lose is to quit. That's the author's point. There's nothing that can keep a professing believer out of heaven except the failure to simply persevere. The righteous shall live by faith, he says in verse 38. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in them. There's no room in heaven for cowards. In fact, they're, they're, they're first in line into the lake of fire. 
you look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's the company cowards keep. But that's not you. That's what he says. It doesn't have to be you. Verse 39, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. So going back to that passage in Revelation 21, let me read you what it says just before that bit that I just read you about, about the cowards. It says, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the, the, spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Nothing can keep you from that eternal reward except the failure to persevere. The only way to lose is to quit. So don't. Look back to when your faith was fresh and look forward to when faith turns to sight. And do both. Right? Not one or the other. Do both. The prescription is both. Because, see, if I'm only looking ahead, I can tend to convince myself that maybe it's not worth it after all. Right? But if I look behind, I can see everything I've endured so far when I was convinced that it was worth it. And I can know that I can't afford to throw it all away. But then if I'm only looking back, I might convince myself that my best days are behind me. And that's not true either. And I can't think of a better illustration of this than marriage. I talked with one of my best friends of 30 years this past week. He's getting a divorce. It's crushing. You know how many times I hear stories of people who just don't love each other anymore, just fall out of love with each other? You know how many children are told mommy and daddy just don't love each other anymore? And it would be better, here's the lie, it would be better for our family to just split up. Divorce rates are so high that one in two children in this country hear that, and it happens about 2,968 times a day. That's catastrophic. And I know I was one of those kids. That happens because people think their best years are behind them. But I can't think of a single thing that's as, as good as it can ever be in the beginning. The only thing that's as good as it ever can be in the beginning is milk. That'll go bad. But we don't think that way about marriage. It's not as good as it can be in the beginning when neither one of you know what you're doing and all you have to run on is attraction. Listen to me, married folks. Don't ever be convinced that the best days are behind you. That's a lie. Do both. Look back and look forward. Look back on the memories of when your love was just beginning to bloom and remember how fresh and new it was. That's good for your marriage. But don't just stay there and lament the fact that it's not that way now and it must be no good then or it's, it's as good as it ever could have been, don't, don't buy into that. Look back on the trials you've endured together as a team, as a unit, as one flesh. Look for God's faithfulness for you there, and then look to a future of God building on the foundations that you have set. You're meant to grow together and not apart. Isn't your marriage supposed to be something like Christ's relationship to his church? Isn't it supposed to be something like that? Didn't Paul say that? You know, and it's funny what he says there too. He, 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 he in essence says like, it's too much for you, blow your mind. But this is like Christ in his church. What's that relationship like? Good in the beginning? Peter's out in the end? Better not be. Better not be. It grows. And it's something more solid. Something that's been tried and proven The only way to fail is to quit. It's the same thing, right? Persevering to the end, 
There's never a time to pack it all in and call it quits. There's never a time to have come all this way and then just stop. Think how far you've come and remember that where you're heading is worth it. You have to do both. You have to do both. That's what keeps you on track. Remembering the good times and how you made it through the bad and dreaming of better ones that lie ahead. Do that, God says, and you will preserve your soul. You will enter his reward of rest. Let's pray.